Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this Thanksgiving uh, week. We're excited that you're here. Really awesome topic to talk about today. We'll learn more about that in just a moment. Uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is James McCoy. I serve as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Success uh, with the Nevada System of Higher Education. Uh, I get the pleasure of working alongside our INSHE Co-Requisite Implementation Task Force. Uh, and certainly today, I want to thank our math uh, representatives on the task force for all their work over the last uh, nearly year, or a little over a year, I guess, at this point. I also want to thank uh, ECMC Foundation and Strong Start to Finish for funding uh, this professional development series for all of you. And that uh, contribution will continue through April as we continue to work through our implementation of Correct Math. And I'd also like to thank Complete College America and Brandon Proto specifically for serving as our liaison and project manager uh, for our professional development series. Today's topic on co-requisite and gateway uh, mathematics placement is on the agenda. We're very excited for this. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Brandon Protus. Thank you, James. And it's good to see so many of you who were on the webinar yesterday, as well as some new faces as well. My name is Brandon Protus. I am a strategy director here at Complete College America. We always wanna tell people who we are because we are so proud and honored to be partnering with Nevada not just for this project in terms of co-requisite support for math, but really so many of the initiatives that are happening in, in the state. So Complete College America, we have a singular focus and that's about increasing college completion rates and closing institutional performance gaps or equity gaps. And while that sounds like two different pieces of the mission, we really see it as one because if we're going to have a significant impact on college completion rates, the only way we're going to do that is by looking at it through an equity lens. And so that's central to what we do. And part of our vision, which you see highlighted below that, is the way that we do that is we do that through the work of institutions and systems and states. Um, that's why we talk about institutional performance gaps. It's how we put that responsibility and the accountability for that change for institutions in terms of creating differences for students and achieving student success. Complete College America is known for having game changer strategies and we've recently expanded our framework to four pillars for how students experience college through purpose, momentum, structure, and support. And while we have a number of strategies, you'll see that I've pointed out co-requisite support. And before we just labeled it as only co-requisite support, but in our new framework, we specifically called out multiple measures. If you're going to do co-rec well, and I, I really commend Nevada for this entire series and looking at co-rec in nuanced ways. If you're going to do it well, you have to look at multiple measures because placement is key to how you do co-requisite support. I would also say that in the structure side, you'll see math pathways and it's great that Nevada has already started on the math pathways. It's you put those three together and you have a winning combination. And so these are part of the strategies that we know make a difference in students. Since you're all in front of a computer, you can go right now to completecollege.org and you can create a profile. If you sign up, you'll get our newsletters. You'll be able to tap into our resources. There's really a treasure trove of information that we use on our, that we have available on our website. It really serves as a portal. So we encourage you to sign up and create a profile today. We want to remind you today is part of an entire series. As I mentioned, the math faculty task force from Nevada put this together specifically looking at topics to support co-requisite support so that it will be a successful implementation in fall of 2021. So today we're going to focus on the methodology of gateway math placement. Um, and you'll see we have several sessions, two per month in February, March, and April. We are going to encourage you to continue logging in. As well, we know a lot of people are watching these uh, and recordings, so please share them with your colleagues as well. At the end of the session, we will remind you to complete an evaluation that is important to us as well. So really, we just wanted to say from Complete College America, we are proud to partner with you. And now what you've all been waiting for, uh, I want to introduce Elizabeth Barnett from CCRC, the Community College Research Center in New York. She is a researcher extraordinaire. I've, I feel fortunate that I've been able to know her for several years and have followed her work. It is exceptional. So she's going to be talking about the multiple measures and then she's brought some colleagues from SUNY um, from a study that they've done recently who are also going to be able to share. So you're hearing both the research perspective as well as the on the ground perspective. And with that, Elizabeth, take it away. 
There we go. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Brandon. And i um, glad to be here and uh, get a little taste of Nevada, although someday I hope to actually be there. Um, I am at the Community College Research Center at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York. And um, I'm really pleased to have um, two colleagues from State University of New York Colleges, um, Brenda White is from SUNY Morrisville and Vanessa Morris from SUNY Westchester. Um, we've been working with the SUNY system and with some SUNY colleges on some research on multiple measures for about six years now. Um, we've got about another year to go on this project and you know it's a topic that that we'll keep on looking at over time. Um, but what I want to do today is um, share some, first of all, some background on multiple measures assessment and why um, it's increasingly being used for placement um, and uh, with the idea that, that, you know, students can be more successful if they're placed properly. I also want to share some information on the national picture, who is doing what in multiple measures, and then spend some time on some of the options that we have for designing a system of multiple measures and taking into account that we're in this kind of strange moment, the system we've been using for placement, um, largely the AccuPlacer test, there's all sorts of complications because of our remote situation in most cases. Um, but in some ways that could be an advantage. It's opening the doors to having to think more and more quickly about um, you know, whether to use different options for placement. Then we'll hear the SUNY Morrisville story. We'll hear the SUNY Westchester story and wrap up with um, the research that we've been doing and the results that we've gotten so far. And if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, Brandon will be monitoring and um, you know, we're happy to, to take your questions as, as we go along. Okay, so multiple measures. What we mean is any system of placement that combines two or more measures to place students into appropriate courses and or supports. Um, and when we say combines, there can be different ways of doing that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use some kind of sophisticated algorithmic system to, to combine them. You could use them in different orders. We'll talk about that later. Um, and what we find is that over time, I'm just gonna move my uh, bar over here to get this out of the way a little bit. Okay, what we find is that over time, there's been a pretty big movement toward using measures other than standardized tests for assessment in colleges around the US. And we find that both in community colleges and in public four-year colleges, the 2016 data shown here is from a survey that was done by um, MDRC and Community College Research Center uh, you know, about three years ago. And then we compared it with data that had been collected a while ago by other researchers. And what you basically see is that you know, as of 2016, you had, you know, well over, well, over half of colleges using more than one measure, something other than standardized tests in um, looking at math and, and reading. And for the 2016, writing is in there as well. So it's become, you know, quite a trend. And the the types of measures that were being used um, were fairly consistent. So almost everybody as of 2016 was still using standardized tests. But um, you know, what we found is that, that quite a number were at that point were using high school performance as well. So, you know, a little over a third. Planned course of study was another, I don't know if you want to call it measure, but another consideration in many cases. And that was especially true in math. I, you know, particularly with math pathways, that's becoming much more of a trend. There were also some colleges using other indicators of motivation or commitment. Um, that can be as simple as asking 
a student how they feel about math, or it could be as complicated as using a non-cognitive assessment. And we'll talk about those options. And you know, pretty much everybody was using um, some form of college readiness assessment. I think what we would see if we looked at that today is that many, many more colleges are, are using multiple measures than we're in, in 2016. So why are we so concerned about this? So um, this is slightly out of date, but what we were finding is that many, many students were starting their college careers in developmental education. And this was particularly true in community colleges, but also to a large degree true in um, open access four-year institutions. And, you know, it used to be seen as just, you know, what was necessary to help students to, you know, to get a good start in college. But increasingly it became apparent that students who were starting college in remediation or in developmental education were less likely to graduate. So these are eight year graduation rates, um, students needing remediation and students not needing remediation. Now, clearly there's a difference in students who come into college needing remediation in terms of their prior preparation. Um, but what we've also seen from a considerable body of research is that um, students who, who um, start off in, in developmental courses, even if they're of similar background to students who do not, um, students who start in developmental classes are less likely to graduate on time. And you know, we think that that has to do with traditional ways of teaching developmental education. Obviously, that's changing a lot. And you know, around the country, we're seeing many, many people turn to co-rec classes, courses. And you know, I know that's that's the way you're going in Nevada. Um, it also has to do probably with the length of time to graduation when you take additional pre-college level courses. So there was. Um, you know, there was kind of an opportunity to look at whether we were placing the right students into college level courses. And my colleague, Judy Scott Clayton, along with some other people, um, also with the Community College Research Center and in other places, started looking at the use of the single placement tests. So AccuPlacer and, you know, back when some of this research was being done, Compass was around too. And they were comparing what would happen um, with students who are placed using a rich variety of predictors versus being placed using the single placement test, what's called the exam here. And they looked at whether students um, could be successful with a B or better. So using a pretty high bar. Um, and so that was, that was what was um, being examined. And what they found was that there were quite a lot of students who were being underplaced. So there were quite a lot of students who could have been successful in college level courses at a B or better level. So first of all, though, they did find that there were students, you know, who were being appropriately placed, you know, quite a number. So that, you know, if the exam said they should be developmental, you know, so did this much better prediction system or, you know, the same with college level courses but you did have a pretty substantial number of students who were being underplaced. So they could have been successful in college level. You also had a few students who were being overplaced were in college courses when they probably would have been better off into develop, in developmental. So let me just stop for a moment. Are there any questions at this point? All right. So what measures are typically considered if you're gonna go beyond placement tests? Well, most often placement tests are still part of a system of multiple measures. Although, you know, in our current environment, that is changing because of, you know, as I said, the difficulties in administering placement tests. But typically it would be placement tests. The other measure that has emerged as being particularly valuable for placement is the high school GPA. And one thing that the Scott Clayton research found was that among the different predictors that they were looking at and considering the high school GPA was by far the more, most likely to be a good predictor of success in college level courses. So you could look at each of those individually. Um, you could also look at what would happen if you considered them together, um, you know, in some kind of a, a predictive, um, you know, algorithm or system. 
And then you could also add in other data points that might be available at colleges. So, you know, many colleges will have the test results. They can, you know, obtain the GPAs, um, but it's less usual to have a lot of other things. But, you know, certainly things like time out, out of school, time since high school, um, type of diploma, um, some college, you know, some colleges will also have other information like class rank or, or 11th grade test scores and so on. Um, and in the, what, in the research that Judy did, and then in the research that we did when we were working with the state university colleges, what we found is that, State University of New York colleges, what we found is that almost every college's data, if you analyzed it, would end up with a profile like this. So what we were looking at was, you know, can you predict, um, or which, which measures best predict success in English, in college level English and college level math, we used to see your better criteria. And um, this is just one college. There were other colleges that had different, um, you know, actual numbers. But what we almost always found this same profile where the high school GPA, which is the first bar was a pretty good predictor. The test by itself was not a very good predictor. If you put the two together, you would get um, better prediction. And if you used a full model, so incorporating some of those other measures, you do an even better job. So basically what you were seeing is that, you know, when you did, when you used multiple measures, when you use more than one measure, you were gonna do a better job of, of predicting success in college. Elizabeth, before you go on, if yeah. um, I may, because we have a couple of questions in the chat and thank you for showing this graph because there was a lot of questions that came up yesterday of what do you mean high school GPA? How does that compare to um, standardized tests? But one of the questions is if there was separate research done on how well high school GPA worked for older students who had been out of high school for a long time. So I don't know yeah. if that speaks to what you have up on the slide now or if you're going to get to that later. I am going to get to that um, just a little bit further along. But then I'm let's glad put a pin that in up. that. Yeah, because you know we are, we are at the point where we feel pretty confident recommending that people include the G high school GPA in any system that they set up, but we need to talk that through further. So we'll do that a little bit further along. And then um, there's a question, Alec um, asked a question, what's the model here? And I'm not sure I understand that question, Alec. Do you want to yeah, unmute? So it's, a, it's basically a regression model predicting, oh, gotcha. yeah, predicting you know, success in English or math courses at this particular college. So it varies by college. You know, different colleges have different um, their courses are a little different, their grading is a little different, you know, but, you know, what we, what the point I, I wanted to make really is that, you know, you tend to see this profile, you tend to see GPA alone is, you know, good, is reasonably good, test alone, not very good, and combined measures are better. Now, one thing you might notice in this case is these, these um, numbers of the, you know, the amount of variation predicted it's not really that high in this particular case, right? So, you know, what we found is across colleges, there's only so much you can predict of. And one last question on the graph that you're showing, is this, a, uh, does this have college entrance requirements since this is uh, for what you're showing here? No, these are community colleges that are open access. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good questions. Um, so kind of where are we at this moment? Better assessment systems are needed. The tests alone are just not doing a good job. And, you know, we see this, you know, across multiple studies and, and actually multiple tests as well. Um, as I mentioned, high school GPA is generally the best predictor across multiple studies. And none of them is a, is a fabulous predictor. So I think we have to, you know, always be a little bit uh, humble in how much, how much we can really expect to get out of any placement system. Okay, so design choices. So things to think about now, you may not have regular access to testing. So, you know, this is an opportunity to be trying other placement strategies. Um, we're gonna hear about some good examples from, from my colleagues that are, that are coming up shortly. Um, some people are testing remotely, but you know, it can be difficult. Many people are using other measures and, you know, building them into, into some kind of a system. Some places are letting students self-place and you know, that can be with help. You know, often we call that directed self-placement and there are you know, other systems out there. 
But, you know, I think the question for all of us right now is, you know, can we set ourselves up for, for the system we want moving forward? Something that's, that's going to be good for students and good for the college and, and practical. So multiple measures options. When you're thinking about a multiple measures systems, there's really three things to think about. First of all, what are the measures that you're gonna to try to include in your system? Secondly, how are you gonna combine them? As soon as you get more than one, you've gotta figure out what you do with them. You know, It's not just a matter of looking at the score that pops out of the, the testing system. And then third, what do you do with the results? So you know, typically that's placement into regular developmental education, um, more, you know, recently, and in the case of Nevada, it'll be placement into alternative coursework. So, you know, who, which students are, are best placed into a co-rec versus a regular college level course. And then in a few cases, people are also thinking about placement into support services. So that's just something to think about, you know, are there some students who ought to be targeted perhaps for more intensive supports? So going back to the measures, um, we have some measures that are administered by the college, and then we have some that have to be obtained. So as soon as you get measures that have to be obtained from elsewhere, there's a level of logistics that has to be thought about, right? You've got to figure out how you're going to get your hands on that additional data. Um, measured by the college, traditional or alternative placement tests. So, you know, a number of colleges come up with their own tests. Um, some colleges are also administering a non-cognitive assessment. There's some complexities that happen when you have, if you're administering more than one test. And there's a few that are in italics here that I just put in because we did run across them occasionally, computer skills inventories, career inventories, um, writing assessments, and then questionnaire items um, may include something like, you know, what kind, you know, helping students figure out what kind of math is gonna be most appropriate for them, maybe what experience they've had with math in the past, you know, those kinds of things. So obtained from elsewhere, high school GPA, other high school transcript information, it's quite common for placement systems in math to want to, to include the last math course that students have taken or which math courses they've taken and or what grades they've gotten in them. So that, you know, certainly is being used pretty widely and then standardized test results. So those are most of the items that we've you know, observed in working with colleges over time. So then the question, as I said, is how you combine them. And I'm gonna look, I'm gonna show you some options on a slide a little further along. But first I wanna talk about the high school GPA in more depth as you know, some of these questions that come up. So first of all, these are the kinds of concerns that that emerge when we talk about the high school GPA. First of all, how are we going to get it? Secondly, well, rather than use the GPA, how about we use another test that's better? Um, and then another one is how far out is a high school GPA still predictive? Is it only for, you know, for recent graduates or, or can you use it for somebody who's been out of, out of school for a while? And then another one that comes up frequently is, you know, what about the difference between high schools? You know, we know that they, you know, there are high schools that are considered to be better high schools, you know, less high quality, do they grade differently? You know, what's the impact of that on placement? So let me just talk about each of these briefly. Um, sources of high school transcript data. So, you know, in many cases, the, the, the student submits a, a transcript at the time of applying to the college. Um, that's great. In many other cases, it's not, you know, it's not a routine part of the process. So in those cases, the college has to figure out how they're going to get the transcript. Are they going to require it of the student? Are they going to, you know, have a system where the, where the high school sends, you know, sometimes they're arrangements with high schools that are sending a lot of students to a given college to send them in a batch. Um, if it can be obtained from the state, that's in many ways ideal, it, you know, just as available. Some states have that, North Carolina is one. And then self-report is another. And so, you know, one question that comes up is how accurately do students self-report? And there's a fair amount of research, and I've just summarized it on this slide, that indicates that students are quite, um, 
quite accurate and um, quite willing to, you know, to report to, to the best of their ability. So, you know, that is being fairly widely used um, in placement systems around the country. There's also some questions about using the 11th grade GPA and the research has shown that, that by the time you're at the end of, your, of the 11th grade year, your GPA is tending to be pretty baked in. You know, you've got most of your coursework having been completed. It doesn't tend to change very much into the 12th grade. Okay, so te other tests. So, you know, there, there may well be tests out there that, that are better, but they're hard to find. And now I'm comparing to the GPA. So the last column in each of these charts is the high school GPA. And the other columns are all the tests that were being used in North Carolina at the time that they were starting to look seriously at multiple measures. And you know, some of them are, are somewhat different versions of, of similar tests. But you know, basically what was found by this through this analysis was that the high school GPA was outdoing any of the tests that were available. Now, you know, if you have a test or want to use a test, you can, you know, certainly do some of your own analyses and see if it, it does a better job of placing students than, than the high school GPA. And you can see that this was the case in both math and English. Okay, so how long is the high school GPA good for? Um, in California, John Hetz and other colleagues there did some research looking at exactly that question. And what they were looking at was um, both the 11th grade and the 12th grade GPA. So the, the blue is the 11th grade GPA, the, the red's the 12th grade GPA. They looked at it in both math and English and they compared it to the ACCUPLACER. So the gray line, the gray horizontal line, that's the ACCUPLACER. And um, across the bottom, you have semesters out of high school. So you have um, zero to 20 semesters out of high school. So what we're seeing in this chart is that in English, even if you go 20 semesters out of high school, the, the, the GPA, whether it's 12th or 11th grade, is doing a better job than the Accuplacer of predicting success in college level courses. If you look at math, um, it's still quite a long ways out, but somewhere around the 14th semester, the Accuplacer is doing better. So, you know, many colleges are setting limits of, you know, maybe three years, maybe five years, you know, maybe they're, you know, doing some of their own research, but, you know, you can have a fair amount of confidence in the high school GPA pretty far out. And then there's the question of um, different high schools. So this was again, the North Carolina research that was looking at this. And what they found was that high school GPA was pretty consistently a quarter or sorry, um, about half a um, 0.4, 0 0.5. Let me say that again. The college GPA was about 0.4 or 0.5 above the high school GPA on a four point scale and that they pretty much tracked. So even if you looked across colleges and across high schools, they weren't seeing a lot of difference. So I've also, you know, know of other colleges that have replicated this research looking at their feeder, feeder high schools and have found a pretty similar um, kind of finding. Okay, let me stop for a moment there. Any questions on that? Uh, can I can I just uh, ask you uh, instead of writing? Yeah, yeah, sure. In, in one of the slides, I think you showed the correlation coefficient between what a student report and accuracy to 0.7, and you said it is pretty high. <laughs> I would have expected that correlation to be, you know, close to one for it to be actually uh, considered high. I mean, if I'm saying something and and if it is only Three quarter accurate. I mean, I don't know yeah. how you consider that very high in 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 any moral com compass. 
Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, that's the lowest of the three studies that are here. You know, we've got on the other one, we've got 0.84 and the other one was, uh, you know, just it wasn't in terms of the correlation coefficient. But um, yeah, you know, I think you have to decide whether, I mean, first of all, you might want to do your own research, but, you know, you also have to decide, you know, whether it's worth it, I guess, to, to include it in your model. You know, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I just brought a point yeah, to that. Yeah. Uh, now, my question, in fact, is that the institution or, mm -hmm. or the researchers who found this number, did they look further that what was the success rate at the institution where they took courses? Um, and, this, and if the success rate is much higher than when they place the student using any standardized testing versus when they used this kind of model. And if that is significant difference. Yeah, no, I think those are all good questions. These studies are not necessarily um, placement studies. They were studies looking at, you know, that had students reporting their own GPA and they were comparing it to actual GPA for different reasons. Ah, oh, got it, got it. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Got, um, got it. But it's, it's a, it's a, good and, is very good, but yeah, and it's not something we looked at in the SUNY study, but we also have been doing some research in Minnesota, and we we are looking. You know, we do have a couple of colleges that are using self-report there, so we're going to do some analysis of. And and if I can ask one more, when you say yeah. that uh, at, I think it was CUNY or SUNY. Uh, uh, so did they created multiple regression models for different uh, courses and different fields? Um, the one that students? the one that Judy Scott Clayton done was basic was basically looking at the using any gateway course in math or English at the colleges. So, so there's one model and you just yeah. have a X number of variables and you and yeah. you predict. Uh, yeah. The coefficient will predict the course uh, course uh, course placement. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we used in our in our SUNY research as well. Is you know basically a replication of that. Okay, let me just spend a few minutes on non cognitive assessments um, just to put them out there as an option. Um, the the thinking here is that there are a lot of factors that influence student success that go beyond their content knowledge. And I think we all kind of know that intuitively to be true. But the question is, can we, you know, is there some way to measure that appropriately? And is there some way to integrate that into some kind of a model for, for placement? Um, so we're actually, you know, as I mentioned, we're doing some, some research in Minnesota and Wisconsin where we're looking at um, non-cognitive assessments as part of a model. And I don't know that we have final thinking yet on whether it's a good thing or kind of worth the additional um, additional work to include it. But we think it's worth, you know, continuing to look at and some colleges may want to include it. So it may be, you know, it may be of general value, but it also may be especially valuable for say, non-traditional students or students where you don't have a high school record or, you know, maybe you have students who are close to some kind of a cutoff on a test. and you know, if the if their assessment shows that they are, for example, motivated, you know, or persevering, you know, maybe that's something you take into account. So when we were looking at these options, um, you know, we we did some analysis of what non-cognitive assessments were out there. Um, two of them, Success Navigator and Engage, College Board and ACT. Um, they each of them have some kind of a academic success indicator index. Um, Success Navigator has a course acceleration indicator where they recommend math or English acceleration. Um, the grit scale was appealing both because it's correlated with GPA and because it's easy to administer. You've got eight or not, you know, eight or 12 points in the grit scale. Um, the one that was used in the in the Minnesota colleges that we worked with was the Lassie, which comes out of Texas and you know, it was, they were mainly interested in the motivation scale and 
they liked the fact that there was a pretty strong body of research that had been around for a while that showed that it was at least correlated with, um, you know, with GPA. So, okay, um, one last topic under design, ways to combine measures. So we have, you know, the algorithms that use the predictive analytics. We have decisional rules or bands and we have directed self-placement. Those are the ones I'm gonna focus on here. And any of these could be, you know, there are ways that any of these can be adjusted, but just to give you the basic idea, um, with the algorithm, what you're doing is you're taking historical data from the college and you're, you, you know, putting it into a, into a model. Um, in the case of SUNY, we had test, we had Accuplacer test scores, we had high school GPA, we had time out of school, we had type of diploma, and in a few cases we had some other data like, um, like their region's test scores, which are the New York State. So we put that into a model, um, came up with prob probabilities of success, and then faculty made a determination on where they wanted to set the cut score. Um, you know, they took different things into account, how many students would end up in what level classes, what the predicted probability, you know, what the pass rates would be at different levels. Um, and they came up with, you know, what the, what the cut scores would be. That information was then basically set up in the college system so that it could be, you know, replicated with any student who came in. You know, you would feed that same information in and come up with their placement. Okay, decision rules. So there may be a number of reasons why um, you don't wanna go through the whole process of using algorithmic type placement. One may be Accuplacer just changed, right? You know, they, so historical data, you know, may not do you much good right now. Another may be, um, you know, it takes a fair amount of IR capacity, you know, maybe that's not where you are. Um, and another, maybe you can't administer tests. So, you know, perhaps what you do is you come up with a set of decision rules. So, you know, in that case, maybe you have some exemptions. Maybe, you know, if a student has a certain SAT or ACT, they go automatically into college level. Maybe if they have a certain, um, if they don't have that, but their high school GPA is at a certain level, they go automatically into college level. And if not, they take the Accuplacer. I mean, that might be one way, but it's basically, setting up a bunch of if-then kind of situations. One variation on that is what we call decision bands. Um, basically, it's saying, you know, if you take, say, an Accuplacer and you're just, let's say, some reasonably small amount below college level, you know, we're going to consider something else, say your high school GPA, or it could be the other way, you know. If you're within, if you're between a 2.6 and a 3.0 high school GPA, we're going to have you take an IQ placer. So it's, you know, just kind of a variation on decision rules. So this is just an example from one of the Minnesota colleges we worked with. You know, basically this is a set of decision rules. You know, if student, you know, students could get waived directly into college level placement. Um, you know, if they had a certain Accuplacer score, they'd go directly into college level placement. And at this college, if they were, you know, below college ready, then they would do further evaluation. They would look at their non-cognitive assessment and their GPA and decide what to do. So. All right. Um, oh, okay. Let me just talk briefly about directed self-placement too. So Florida, um, basically made um, developmental education optional for almost all their students starting in 2014. So the question was what was gonna happen, you know, when they did this. And, you know, some students, we don't know exactly how much direction students were getting. Some I'm sure were getting advised, some may not have been too much. Many student, many more students opted into college level courses than were placed into them in the past. And some of them took co-rec or compressed courses and many others just didn't take math at all in the first semester. And what you found, what you got overall is that you had more students passing college level math in the first semester than had been the case in the past. So we, you know, we saw many more students passing that bar. We also saw higher failure rates in the classes themselves. 
Um, the students who did the best were in those combined courses and the in the ones that were co-rec or compressed, but those were still being underutilized. So I just wanted to share that research. And also some, some research um, that was done in a college where for some reason or another, they didn't have access to placement tests for a semester and were allowing students to, um, you know, to self-place, but with, with advising. And again, what they found is that more students were choosing to enroll in college level or transfer level math, um, but there were some equity issues like more female, black and Hispanic students were enrolling in the lower levels of math. So on the good side though, there was decreased withdrawal from courses. Students seemed to feel like, you know, seemed to stay where they were, where they placed themselves at higher levels. And there were also more students that completed the math required for an associate's degree. So, you know, we have some evidence, although it's pretty, it's still pretty sparse that this approach can be good. And, you know, we're gonna be doing some more research on this in the future, we hope, so. Okay, so if you are doing directed cell placement, you might consider adding questions to students' admission forms, offering individual advising, professional development to minimize threats to equity, to make sure that students aren't, are, you know, evaluating themselves, you know, or not under evaluating themselves, not placing themselves lower than they might be able to succeed and then keeping an eye on the results of your system. All right, so any questions before I pass this along to um, Brenda? And if you do have questions, you can unmute yourself to ask it. If, you if nobody know. has it, I always have a question. Okay. And, and my question maybe uh, is more uh, to, to my own colleagues here in Nevada is that, just, just a pondering that uh, we have developed what is called uh, core acquisite courses in fall. And most of our gateway math core acquisite courses are open enrollment. How's, how relevant multiple majors are when for, for, for most students, uh, who are placed into uh, remedial, they can go into core acquisite courses anyway without being placed anywhere or taking any placement. So, so, so what I'm asking our experts is, is are, 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 we, are we still, or should we still look into that multiple majors when we we are placing, at least at community colleges, we used to place majority students into uh, remedial. So, right. so that is already gone. So, so I, don't, I didn't know whether, uh, Ms. Barnett, whether you knew this, this is the development in Nevada or not. And in, in light of this new development that will take place in fall 2021, how should we look at the same problem that you are uh, helping us look at it. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. And, and yeah, they had told me that that was the new policy. It, it seems to me that what you're really looking at is who, who you want to place into um, regular college level courses versus into co-rec courses, right? So that's going to be your main question. And then you know what the criteria are that you want to use. So it may be a combination of, um, you know, students' content knowledge in math, and perhaps some other item, you know, other questions that have to do with how much help they they feel like they need. Um, but my two colleagues that are presenting today are both um, placing students, you know, into into both co-rec and college level courses. They also have some students going to developmental. So. I think that, you know, perhaps their, their thoughts on this would be really helpful as well. I appreciate it. And, and, and I would also like to know if they how they are able to keep the developmental courses because we in Nevada have been told you can't keep it. Uh, and and, and our, our request, which was denied, was that we should keep it for those who can't even 
uh, say how to, who can't even pronounce two, three, four, uh, you know, the numbers, but uh, that discussion is for some other day. Well, New York is a very different state, but Brenda, let me turn it over to you and maybe- you Elizabeth, can, can you hear me? Elizabeth, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, so I, it, it got fixed. It wasn't, I was trying to speak and it wasn't working, sorry. No. But regarding the students, you early in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that students not needing remediation had a graduation, had an eight-year graduation rate of 43%. So what happened to the rest of these, these students, the, the other 57%? Were, were they transferring? Were they, what was happening to them? Um, I do not remember that the details of that study, but in general, it's not too unusual for community colleges to have low graduation rates. I, you know, that's kind of what we see across the country. I mean, there are some students who don't graduate but do transfer and don't get counted in those graduation figures. So that is some of them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. So Brenda, shall I, would you like to take over? Um, thank you uh, to all of you for having me today. My name is Brenda White and I am a professor of mathematics at SUNY Morrisville. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of the college that I am coming from. So SUNY Morrisville, uh, we are not a community college. Um, so a, a lot of the things that have been coming up are, are very, very important points when we're talking about placement. We are a bit of a unique college. We are located in rural central New York. So if some of you know, say Syracuse, New York, which is known for their basketball, football, also great educational school, we're located very close to the central part of New York, um, but very much so rural. So you would think that our population would be very, um, homogeneous. We'll talk about that in a moment. We have under 3,000 students and as most campuses across the United States are suffering from enrollment issues, we are as well. COVID has hit us very hard also. We offer both associate and bachelor degree programs, about 50 programs in all, and we are an agriculture and technical college. So some of our most popular majors are nursing, automotive technology, business administration, um, individual studies, and then animal services. Uh, a couple other very popular majors are equine science. We have probably one of the uh, most amazing rehab clinics for horses, and then also criminal justice. So if you look at our popular majors, another thing that really affects us is our, our gender equity. Um, so nursing, still predominantly a female area, and then automotive technology, still predominantly a male area. So we're gonna see that that actually balances out our, our campus um, student numbers very nicely. So in terms of overall diversity score. So as I was talking, um, we're located in central rural area of New York. Um, so not New York City, we're about four hours north of New York City. But notice please our ethnic diversity scale score as it compares to the national average. We are a very diverse campus. So about 40% of our students come from the downstate area, which is New York City or Long Island. And so our ethnic diversity score is quite high. We are not a local fed school, and that is because we're not a community college. So about 90% of our, our students come from New York State, but from all over New York State. As we talked about in terms of gender diversity, you can see that we are quite um, well above the national average. So about 54% of our students are female, 46% are male. 
And then geographic, you can see that we are under the national average and that is because um, uh, only about 10% of our students come from other areas of the country or the world. Another point about our students, because we're, we're not a community college, most of our students are of um, traditional age. So about 68, 69% of our students are, are what you would probably term as traditional age between 18 and, and 21 years of age. Um, but we do have, do have some post-traditional students as well, which then feeds into the question that we had beforehand of, of how accurate is high school GPA for, for say those students that may have been out of high school for you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years. So how does that affect our population? And if we look at the next slide, So as we, um, I said earlier, we are not a community, oops, if you could go back to that, Elizabeth. Great, thank you. We are not a community college. We are not open access. So we do have to look at our students' high school transcript information or college transfer information uh, prior to acceptance. And so that is where we use the high school GPA. So we try to set a bar for the students in terms of what we're looking at for admission. So the middle 50% of our students have a high school GPA of say 81 to 88. I also know given enrollment issues as well as COVID factors that there has been talk of the high school GPA standard um, the pressure to slip that a little bit because of competition within the state. So everyone is fighting over students right now. We do not require SAT or ACT scores, but most of our students do have that. So that's another factor that we can often use with um, for deciding on acceptance, but also we use it for placement. About 73% of our students do live on campus. And again, that, that's often because we have about 40% coming from downstate. Um, and then we have quite a large percent, uh, about 30% that live, say, more locally. And as you can see, about 80% of our students do receive financial aid. That speaks to placement often as well because we have quite a high percentage of students that are financially um, needy, as well as first generation students that often struggle with adapting to college life. And next slide. So talking about our math placement process. So, we have been at the college for 25 years now. So I have quite a history and knowledge of our math um, placement process. And so when I first came to the college, um, we were hand looking at, um, so individually we would have a, a huge meeting where we would actually take their high school transcript information, analyze it, and then write on the form where we, we had an idea of where that student should be placed that would then be entered into the system and the student would be placed into what we believed was an appropriate math course. And at that time, again, we're talking 20 years ago, we only had an algebra track. That was it. So very traditional. You went into um, elementary algebra and you were expected to maybe go on through calculus or above. So that was the history there. Um, over time, we realized that it was not such a, a great science of just placing by their transcript information. So we felt like we needed another fact. And so what we began to think about is 
um, we needed a placement test. But because we're in agriculture and technical college, our algebra track of classes combine both algebra with trigonometry. And so all of the placement tests that we were looking at just weren't really fitting our needs. So we began to talk about actually creating our own um, placement test. So as we were developing our placement test, we also began working with both admissions and our IT department of trying to be more effective and consistent with our placement process. So we did, did um, develop an algorithm to be able to place, oh, if you could go back, Elizabeth. Sorry. That's okay. To place our students in there, and I'm gonna be very specific about this, in their initial math course. So just, just let's call it level one, <laughs> their initial math course, which is based on their high school information. So that could be state exam scores, SAT or ACT, as well as time since last math course. But then we also started thinking about students' academic programs. And we recognized that sometimes, although we all might love algebra and calculus, et cetera, sometimes students don't always need that for their program or their potential careers. So we also developed a quantitative reasoning test. So with all of this information, we were getting a, a pretty decent initial math placement. So an example of the algorithm that we created, a student would be placed in pre-algebra if their state exam score for algebra, which would be their ninth grade year usually of, of work, is less than 70%. Or if it was over 69 and then they had an SAT score that was, let's say, quite low or an ACT score that was also quite low. So that would give us a, a starting point for our students. If their algebra score was above 69, but their geometry score, which is usually their 10th grade level of mathematics, was less than 70, and their, let's say their algebra two score was also less than 70, then maybe we had some SAT or ACT information that was helping us to know if that student would be say placed in elementary algebra or our other path, which is quantitative reasoning. So both of these levels are what we would term remedial or developmental. And this is the area where we're trying to mitigate in terms of trying desperately to increase our college completion rate as well as closing our equity gap. So along with our initial math placement, we wanted to have a checks and balance system in place. And if you could now go on to the next slide. Oops, it's still stuck. There we go, excellent. So along with our algorithm to give our students their initial math placement, we also created what we term a homegrown placement test, which has four parts. The first part is arithmetic. Secondly is elementary algebra. Third is intermediate algebra. And then the last part of this is college algebra or pre-calculus topics. It only has a total of 60 questions and it is not split up evenly. So um, the, the major chunk of it is with the elementary algebra and the intermediate algebra, because that really is helping us figure out where our students um, probably need to be mathematically. All of the parts contain multiple choice questions. Calculators are not allowed. Um, so the design of our, our questions is very important so that a calculator is not needed. 
we work on that and we continue to, to try and strive to make sure our questions are um, effective. And then sufficient score must be met for a student to be able to move on to the next part. So if they start with part one and they're only able to answer a couple questions, it'll say you are now done. If they were able to answer about 75% correctly, then they're moved on to the second part, which is elementary algebra and so forth. It is given through our learning management system. It is online and then students do have two attempts. And then if something happens technologically where they're kicked out and they weren't quite done, they have the ability to contact our um, campus IT department and then we can reset their placement test for them. We also worked with our IT department to create a rubric. And so the initial math placement is based on their placement test score and their academic program. So a student would place in pre-algebra if they scored between a zero and 11 for um, uh, the first part, uh, possibly combined with the second part. And they, um, you can see a 12 out of 23, uh, 12 to 23 range would place them in either elementary algebra or quantitative reasoning, depending on their program code and so forth. So if you remember, um, the first step in our placement process is actually using high school transcript or college transcript information. That gives us our, our first initial math course placement. We have a secondary math course placement, which is done by our placement test. What we then do as our checks and balance system is we have a program that our IT department created, which is called our discrepancy report. And so after the placement, through the placement test, we run our discrepancy report and it kicks back any students that had say an initial placement at the pre-algebra level, but then miraculously they are testing at the calculus level. We know probably something happened there um, with maybe some cheating and that helps us go on a case by case basis and look at their high school transcript information and make a determination or contact the student and say, we need you to take this placement test again. So we have been doing this system for about 10 years now um, and really feel like it's helping us in terms of when we get our, our set of students in our classroom, we're feeling like they're in the right place that they are understanding the information, they're able to communicate with their, their peers, with their instructors, and seem motivated um, to, to work on the course. Okay, next. Are there any questions before we go on? I just have a couple more slides. I'm assuming that this placement test is proctored, correct? So it is not proctored, it is remote. And that was a worry that we had. We used to proctor it fully. We used to do it paper and pencil and would have usually about 300 students in a room. And then we moved it to online, but we still had it on campus. And then um, because our students come from all over the state, we needed to be a little bit more accommodating to them. So it is not proctored and we have not seen a significant difference in outcomes, which really helped us when COVID hit because we did not have to change our protocol. And what helps, um, I think that was, um, El uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Eloc? Yes, yes. Great. Um, so. Oh. That was something that we, we really um, were very protective as we should be about our courses in terms of integrity. 
but that's one of the things that I think the checks and balance system of our, our, our process really helps with is if it's uh, an unproctored situation, if they're going to cheat, it, it usually comes out um, because what they're scoring is very different than what their high school or college transcript information was first indicating. So we have very, um, I would say only about 10% percent discrepancy rate of a student say placed initially at the elementary algebra level, but placed at the um, one level up intermediate algebra with trig level. So we can usually be able to look at their transcript information and, and adjust from there. Thank you. You're welcome. So just a few examples to give you an idea. Again, our full set of placement questions um, is only 60 questions. So at the arithmetic level, we're testing just a little bit on not only mathematics, but also reading comprehension. So making sure that they can do a, what we would term a simple arithmetic operation with both positive and negative numbers. Elementary algebra, and you know, just a little bit of algebra work to understand if they know how to work with a proportion. Intermediate algebra, we're looking at things in terms of understanding functions, including identifying graphs of functions. And then at the college algebra or pre-calculus level, we're looking at you know, logarithmic equations, exponential functions, and then trigonometry as well. And then next. And so uh, place my process and plans for the future. So as I said earlier, um, in terms of a response to COVID-19, our campus shut down as probably many campuses across the nation did. Um, our campus shut down and all students had to go to remote format in mid-March of 2020. Um, we did allow students to return to our campus, but it was only about half of what we usually have. Um, our cases have been pretty low. Uh, we have been very diligent about uh, adhering to mask use and distancing, but all of our courses did move to remote. <coughs> the majority of our courses were still remote this fall. Some were hybrid, some were hyperflex, and then we are now back to fully remote. So all of our students moved back home prior to this week and will not be returning to our campus. Because our placement test is remote, um, we were set for that, so we didn't have to make many adjustments. Things that we would like to do, we would like to have some sort of non-cognitive assessment. And we work very closely with our English department as well. And our English department places by high school transcript also. And then they do a first day writing assessment, but sometimes they are, they're feeling like first day is a little bit too late. So we are thinking about planning um, a non-cognitive assessment piece to our placement exam, which the English department could use as well to really look at grit, motivation, perseverance, and mindset. As you probably all know, sometimes it's not about their grades. It, it's about those other factors of, you know, really fighting through issues, um, connecting with others, sense of belonging, et cetera, um, which are harder factors for us to measure. And so we, we're um, trying to, we have that set for a goal for the future. Another component of our placement test that we have designed, but uh, um, COVID has really put a, a hitch in our plans is we have a literacy assessment um, 
portion of our placement test designed and ready to go, but we need to do some more data assessment to make sure it's at the right level. We are also working on rewriting problems on our placement test because we want to ensure that um, proctoring or non-proctoring is not an, an issue for our placement test. And then finally, curriculum revisions. So our curriculum revisions that we're looking at is really making sure that our pathways are streamlined, that we're meeting the needs of our individual students and programs, and then also increasing the number of co-requisite courses on our campus. We have quite a few students that place at the remedial slash developmental level for mathematics on our campus. But we also recognize that some of them are quite motivated in their program of study. So if we can increase the number of courses where the developmental level curriculum is integrated into the gateway course in a just-in-time fashion, we feel like we're going to meet the needs of our students um, much better. Are there any questions for me before we move on to Vanessa? Brenda, I have a question. Um, how do you go about placing students into your cover classes? So we have a campus-wide advising program on our campus. And so they are aware of our co-rec courses. And so if they place at the um, developmental level, but their program requires the gateway level, then they consult with the students and help them understand that this might be a better choice for them so that they can um, stay on top of their work in a more timely fashion by making sure that they really have an opportunity to be in a course that they feel has value to them. That's been quite successful for us. Great. And I think someone had mentioned um, the pressure to, your, your state has of getting rid of all of your developmental courses. We have not had that uh, placed on us yet. <laughs> And our hope is if we keep increasing the number of co-requisite courses we have, that we will not be mandated to get rid of our developmental level. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks so much, Brenda. You're welcome. Stop sharing and we'll turn it over to Vanessa and her colleagues. So, hi everybody. Um, my name is Vanessa Morast, and I'm the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost of Westchester Community College. And I'm actually joined um, by my colleagues from the college because what we'll be talking about today is <clears throat> essentially taking some of um, Elizabeth's work and translating it into um, into procedures and action at our college. Um, most recently, as a result of COVID, we went to a placement process that's directed self-placement. And so um, in order to get that done, we had a, this team um, that's listed here on the slide, Scott Petorti, our testing coordinator, uh, Michelle Campagna, um, our assistant dean for learning initiatives and student success, and then Jonathan Reyes, who is in our IR department and was able to quickly program um, Qualtrics to be able to do what we wanted it to do, which is that um, branching decision uh, scheme that helped us to be able to place students. So to give you a little bit of background, Westchester Community College is part of the SUNY system. Um, we have uh, around 11,000 students um, in the fall semester, about uh, 2,600 are new first time students. So most of those students as we're a community college tend to show up sometime between May and August, about 50% of them start showing up in August. And so we have 
to place them quickly and um, accurately, and it has a big uh, implication for our enrollment and um, all of the operations of the college, how well we can place students. Uh, we are a majority minority college. We're also um, a Hispanic serving institution. Um, so we're very proud of the diversity of our student population. And we're a pretty typical community college with a large part-time attendance as well as full-time. Um, we've also been lucky enough to be involved in a number of national initiatives. So we have um, a fair amount of knowledge base that's developed at the college over the past few years um, in uh, student success and what's happening in, in the research. Um, so the history of our placement process um, really looks like this. In 2016, we were mostly using the AccuPlacer um, and an essay, and we got involved with the CAPRA study um, that was uh, dealing with multiple measures. And so what, what the college did, and this was actually prior to my time at the college, I arrived in 2017. Um, but the college engaged in the study, which essentially uh, placed half of our students using an algorithm and the other half were not. And so it was an experiment. Um, the algorithm was based on many of the components of multiple measures, um, but it was not something that was really under our control. It was programmed into our system and students were placed into classes um, for the purpose of, of uh, the CAPRA research on multiple measures. After that ended, we had a dilemma because we could see that we had improvement in terms of student outcomes. We also saw a major shift in terms of the proportion of students who were placing at the college level, which was particularly true in English, but was also true in math. We could tell that if we went back to what we were doing before, that it would be damaging to the students. And so we didn't want to return. Um, but we also uh, were worried about certain aspects of the algorithm and our control over it, and um, especially where there was missing data. And so we embarked on some work together, um, really to try to understand how better to place our students and what, what was working and what wasn't. Um, we have a large high school partnership program, and through that program, we had access to um, lots of transcripts. And so we're also placing students in our high school partnership program using the transcripts. And one of the things that we noticed was on all the transcripts and very readily available was the New York Regents score, which we were using to place those students. And so we realized we had at our fingertips actually a pretty uh, robust set of information that we could use that was working to place students. We had seen how the algorithm had um, impacted our placement processes, our curriculum, and um, everything that we were doing. And so we were um, very open to changing what, changing our practice and trying to figure out what to do. But we did keep the AccuPlacer um, as part of our system for students, especially those who were more than five years out of high school so that we had a way to test them. Um, I should also mention that we had, I think an important component of this is our uh, Developmental Education Advisory Committee, which is led by uh, Michelle Campagna. And that committee is made up of our uh, department chairs for English and math and reading. We have a reading program um, still. And, um, and also our academic support center testing um, and our student affairs area is also represented on that committee. So so it's really a great representation. And basically what happened when COVID hit, we had already spent a year um, in 2019, 2020 using multiple measures um, through a system of waivers. So essentially most many students could use their existing test scores and GPA to place um, into college level courses. Um, and so we realized in March that we had a problem that we wanted to solve, which was that we weren't going to use the AccuPlacer. Um, Westchester was very hard hit by COVID, and uh, we knew that we weren't going to be having students coming into the testing center. We also looked at, um, at methods of proctoring the AccuPlacer and realized that our student body was not going to be able to accommodate doing that in their houses. And so we quickly shifted gears and because we had that developmental education um, advisory committee in place, 
we were able to um, ramp up um, a directed self-placement. Um, and so this is essentially our system. We call it a waiver system, but basically these are decisions that allow us to determine that a student is at college level um, versus developmental. I didn't put all the details in here um, because they're available in our system. They're also in our directed self-placement, which we could demo if there's interest in that. Vanessa, um, yep. can you go back that slide? Just one quick question, because this yep. comes up often. Just to be clear, students uh, can waiver in placement by, it's an or, so either an SAT, a ACT score, or a score on the New York State Regents exam or That's a high correct. school GPA, not a combination, just to be clear, correct? Yes, to be clear, it's, a, it is, it's an or situation. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's kind of what lends itself to essentially if-then statements, which is exactly what we translated into our Qualtrics direct placement survey, directed self-directed placement survey. And, um, and then we still had the problem of what to do with students who, after they'd been through those if-thens, then they would have been directed to the Accuplacer because they couldn't be placed on the basis of any of these measures. Um, and so at that point, we brought in some, uh, some non-cognitive questions as well as some questions that allowed students to self-rate themselves as opposed to Attempting, um, it, attempting a math problem or a, a reading question or, or writing. Um, and I don't know if you saw, we just got a question in on the chat, which of course we knew was coming. What is your high school GPA cutoff? Um, is it an overall grade or is it which classes, you know, gen ed, math, et cetera, if you could. It um, is an overall grade. And Scott, when, Scott's gonna start in just a second and he actually can get more granular on that. Um, but I believe it's an overall grade for everything. I don't think we drill down to the high school class level, although we do for our, placing our students in the high school partnership program. So, um, you know, there they have to have just as you would with articulation, they have to have a particular grade um, in order to place. I think it's a B or better in the high school classes. Um, so this is, this is what happened to us as we went through this process of um, implementing the multiple measures, first of all, the algorithm, and then um, also this is where we started out. We had half of our students going into developmental. And, um, and then over time, you know, we had this experience as a college of watching more and more students go into college level and succeed. Um, we also, during this time frame, piloted and then scaled our co-requisite model. It's currently completely scaled in English um, where we have several hundred of our entering students take the co-rec English class and we're in the process of scaling it for math. So all of these things were kind of happening concurrently and, um, and I think really were an important part of setting the stage to be able to do this directed self-placement and to put it into place relatively quickly. Um, the key components, I think, really being the ex existence of the waiver system and the experience with this kind of placement, um, and then the existence of a committee that brought together the key people on a routine basis to look at these questions across departments. Um, and then the fact that we did have the co-rec model and we were really looking to place our students at college level one way or another. And then lastly, it was really the sense of urgency, which is what brought the four of us together um, to try to quickly uh, get into place a system that would allow students to determine their own placement. So at this point, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Scott and he can talk a little bit about the details of that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. So my name is Scott Petorti. I am the coordinator of testing and assessment and to make everyone also feel comfortable. I also moonlight as a mathematics adjunct. So welcome all the math people. Um, so first, I really want to emphasize that we are not experts in directed self-placement. We are kind of like all of you. We're an institution that is doing the best we can in a very challenging time to support our students. So as an institution, we truly felt that after reviewing a lot of different options, and I mean a lot, that directed self-placement would provide us with the best ability to place our students in the pandemic situation we found ourselves in. So next, I'll just go over a quick uh, definition. 
The goal of directed self-placement is to help students integrate self-analysis with data and course expectations consistent with the goal of optimizing student investment, experience, and resolve in determining their course placement. So this definition was actually introduced by the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, which was for when we were developing our directed self-placement, a, a rich amount of resources that we used for our own development. And I throw this out to everybody here. Um, for our development, it wouldn't have been possible without me reaching out to all these other institutions across the country that have done directed self-placement before us and answering all my countless questions and being very nice to kind of explain how it works, their thoughts and everything else. And I kind of, you know, in, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I want to give that same giving to everybody here. If you have questions on anything, if you'd like to more details, please reach out to me. Um, I think it's extremely important uh, for us to be able to work together to kind of learn from each other. Scott, um, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, after you talk, can you be sure to put your email into the chat? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I will answer, I promise. Um, maybe not on Thanksgiving, but the day after I will. Um, so I also want to mention that directed self-placement is really a holistic approach that evaluates a student based on data and self-assessment of their own ability. And much like multiple measures, what I found was that there really isn't a cookie cutter approach to directed self-placement. It really varied from institution to institution, which is why it's important to keep the needs of your institution and the needs of your students at the forefront of your decision-making. Um, we did not reinvent the wheel, but we took what other institutions were having success with and we developed to meet our own unique needs at our institution. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at quickly is the structure of what our directed self-placement is like. And as Dr. Morris had mentioned, um, if people are interested and we have time, we could demo this for you. And if we don't have time and you reach out to me, I would be happy to kind of go through it bit by bit. There's a lot of branching logic and complexity that these slides are just not going to capture in the tool that we created. Um, so once the decision was made to use directed self-placement, we began the process of actually designing the actual questionnaires. And this was an extremely collaborative endeavor with input from the testing center, IR, faculty, academic deans, members of the DIAC committee, student services, the provost. I think I literally named everybody in the college, but it really was a team effort. And I think it's important to say that this was really driven by faculty. It was the faculty the departments that had a lot of say and input into the decisions that we were going forward with. Um, and we ultimately ended up with two questionnaires, one that contained English, ESL, and reading, and a separate one for mathematics. So the questionnaires were built in Qualtrics, which is chiefly a survey tool, but allows for a lot of customization and behind the scene work that you could uh, really customize it. And the questionnaire makes extensive use of branching logic to only give students questions or sections that are relevant to them. So for example, um, there is branching logic used to determine should a student be directed to the English questionnaire or should they be directed to the ESL questionnaire. There is also scoring that goes on behind the scenes that automatically generates a placement for students based on the responses. And I kind of want to pause and stop here because directed cell placement at WCC is quite different when you compare it to many other institutions across the nation in regards to this. Traditionally, in many different guided and or directed cell placements, students have the final say in which, uh, which class they're going to place into. For us, that's not the case. We have a more structured system in which their score to the, uh, to the questions that they answer determines their placement. Now, students may only take the D uh, DSP one time. However, if they are unhappy with the placement after a conversation with a counselor, they may actually challenge the results by taking a traditional placement exam, which in our case is AccuPlacer for math. So the questionnaires can be roughly separated into kind of three sections. The first and the shortest is the demographic section. So this section really just collects student information um, that we use in my office to verify the student is who they're saying they are. And also it determines if the student is eligible for the directed self-placement and if so, which parts should they be branched into. The second section is the academic block, which is where students can self-report their high school GPA, course grade, or standardized exam scores. This is aligned to the criteria that we use for multiple measures and the waivers that Dr. Moresh was describing earlier. So during this section, if a student actually meets one of our multiple measures, they have a GPA or they have a region scores, 
the questionnaire will actually end and the student will receive a college level placement. Um, students are only branched into this section, the academic block, if they have a US high school degree and have graduated in the past 10 years. If a student does not meet the academic block requirements by having a standardized exam score or a GPA, or they are not eligible for it, it's been longer than 10 years, or they have a foreign high school degree, um, they skip the academic, uh, academic block and automatically go into what we call the questionnaire block, which was designed by each department with different content questions and other types of things we'll talk about in a little more detail. So the final section is this questionnaire block which contains a wider range of questions that ask students about their comfort with course content and topics they may face in college level courses. It also includes non-cognitive questions such as about their study skills or their time management skills. And these questions were designed by the academic departments and we really relied on their expertise to design and really uh, hammer down what do, you, what do these students need to be successful in their courses. Each questionnaire depends on the amount of questions on the different, uh, be it reading, English, or math, but they range in general for the questionnaire part about nine to, five, uh, nine to 15 questions. Next, please. Uh, I see a question. Let me just grab that in chat real quick. Um, do you receive a single score from the DSP or are you able to mine down to rich levels of decision making? That's a great question, William. So um, right now it allows you to do both. So it does give us a general score, which is the score we most commonly use um, for placement purposes. And we do have different developmental levels. We have two different developmental level, uh, level courses and we have college level. And I should mention here that the directed self-placement questionnaire will not let students place into higher level math classes. We're not letting them place into pre-calculus. We're not letting them place into calculus using this questionnaire. But in terms of being able to have further conversations, that questionnaire is available to see how they answer those questions. What do they put in for the GPA? What was their highest level math class? So all that information is available and can be discussed with our counselors. All right, um, so the next thing I kind of want to mention is that I want to quickly go over some of the content about these questionnaires. So it's really important to recognize that this is really not an exam for the most part, even though the reading questionnaire does have two, I guess you would call more exam content questions. Um, but in general, this is not a test. We're not asking students to factor a quadratic equation as much as I might love doing that myself. Um, we don't make them do that. Um, or we're not going to make them write essays either. Um, however, we do ask about course content, how comfortable they are with certain topics and non-cognitive questions. So for example, you could see some of the general questions we ask in English. Um, we ask, uh, have in the past three years, how many essays have they written that have been two pages or longer? And we have a number of options for them. Um, we give them a reading in the English portion where it's a, it's a complex college level reading um, that the department had picked. And we're not asking them to go in there and hammer down to the details, but then we start asking them, when you read that, how did you feel about that in, in terms of the complexity of it? So these are kind of the questions we are going for when we're looking at it. But you got to remember for DSP, you could kind of explore and meet your needs. It doesn't mean that you can't put content questions in it if you feel that's the best way to kind of analyze and figure out where to place your students. Um, next, please. And here's some math questions. So as I said, we're not asking them to solve these, but here is a group of questions that would correlate to our developmental courses in terms of pre-algebra or beginning algebra or some of our quantitative math courses. Um, and it asked them to take a look at these questions and out of these questions, how many do you feel that you can comfortably answer? And again, it's not a test question and we are relying on students being truthful when they answer this. And honestly, part of me, and this is just, you know, I don't have data to prove this, I wonder if we gave them a question to do on their own at home, because again, like many institutions, we don't have the resources in my uh, testing department to, to proctor every single exam. Can they, you know, if I give them a test question, are they just gonna go look that up with PhotoMath or some other app? Or if we're asking them honestly, kind of off the cuff to look at these and really say, how many do you think you could do? Which one is a more honest response? And I don't know, um, but you know, my gut kind of says, I think students might be more truthful this way. Next, please. 
Um, and also, I did want to mention, if anybody wants to see the full questionnaires, if you do email me, again, I'll throw that out there, I'm happy to send you samples of the questionnaires we created. So you could kind of play around and go through the branching process. You could really see what it's like to be a student. I'm happy to share those links with anybody that's interested. So the next thing I want to go over, and this is a really important part, um, and we were able to accomplish this in a very short period. And again, I give kudos to this as really being a team from a lot of different functional areas to make this happen is the business process. Um, how is this going to be mapped uh, in, into the process for the different offices for our students? So given the short time frame we were facing when the pandemic hit, our goal at WCC was not to reinvent our entire onboarding process, right? That's not what we're trying to do. We didn't have time for that. But we are trying to enact a DSP in the existing structure of our institution and focus on the remote environment. And again, I kind of want to stress when I was doing my research and contacting schools, this process really differed from institution to institution. It was based on the instrument they were using. It was based on the resources that they had available and on their needs. So just as much planning needs to go into mapping out these processes as does the development of an actual DSP tool. They go hand in hand and they have to work together. So due to the time, I'm not going to go into all the details of what we did at WCC, but if you're interested, I'm always happy to talk about it and talk a lot about it. Um, and I want to remember what works for us might not work for you, right? It might be a completely different system that you're dealing with. Um, and especially it looks like co-rec is a big topic that you guys have to discuss that is unique to you guys. Um, so what I do want to mention, though, are some of the general questions that I kind of thought about as we started to map the process out. So some things we talked about is when will students be given access to the questionnaires? Do they receive it before counseling? Do they receive it with a counselor? There's many ways to kind of organize this. Do students select their final placement? Um, do they get the final say? Or is it determined by the questionnaire responses like ours, which is, again, more of a structured score-based uh, placement system? Will they be allowed to take the questionnaire on multiple occasions or just parts? In our case, they can only take it once. Um, who will monitor the process at the college? What office is responsible for it? In this case, it's my office. So at what point will students meet an advisor? And I really want to highlight this, and I didn't get to read the question in chat yet, but someone had, I saw us ask something about counseling. And direct self-placement and counseling go hand in hand. And it is something we are trying to really strengthen now that we have the system in place, we have the tool in place, we have the processes in place. The next piece for our institution is really integrating it into counseling. So we've already had meetings and we're gonna to continue to have meetings, but it's an extremely important part, not just to say, hey, this student filled a questionnaire, this is where they belong. It's about that conversation with the student. Are they, do they really know what the expectations are? Are they comfortable with the expectations that they need to be successful in those courses? And on the bottom here, we do have our website. Um, if you're interested, um, feel free. I think uh, we might be able to post that in chat for you. Um, take a look, it actually goes through the processes of what a student expects at WCC and how they have to request it from my office and kind of gives you those details if you were interested in that. Next, please. So this was one thing that we discussed before we actually implemented, right? We, we weighed a lot of different options. We talked about continuing active placer on, um, on Zoom. We talked about using multiple measures and transcript evaluation across the board. So these are the pros and cons we weighed that ultimately led us to deciding DSP was the, was the best bet for our institution. So some pros um, is that once it's developed, it can easily be administered remotely with relative ease compared to other proposals. And as the testing and assessment coordinator who lives this day to day, every day, sometimes Sunday, but not on Thanksgiving, um, I am very pleased actually how this turned out. Um, implementing anything this big, this quickly, there are bound to be problems and challenges you didn't plan for. And I can tell you, we did run into things we did not expect. It's not perfect, but it has worked extremely well, not only for my office, but has for the students who are completing this at home. And I really do believe this solution has greatly lessened the barriers of entry into the college for placement compared to a number of other options we are considering, especially a placement exam where you can only test five at a time uh, for a four hour exam. Um, and as I said, we test over 3000 for an incoming cycle that, you know, those numbers were just not adding up for my staff. 
Um, and it is a very quick and easy experience for our students that they can accomplish remotely. Another pro we considered is that we felt it created a holistic approach that evaluates a student based on data and self-assessment of their own ability. So you have the ability to put together a diagnostic that looks at a number of different factors. And to me, this was actually one of the biggest selling points, right? We could take what we learned about multiple measures and combine students' academic history, those GPA questions, those region scores, and all that academic history. And we could then combine it with comfort level with course content, motivation, study habits, and whatever else you think is important in providing insight into a student's placement. Um, so it can really be a holistic tool that um, makes students an active participant in the, per in, in the process. And I think that's important. You know, we're not just asking students to answer questions that they probably didn't study for. We're getting them involved to think about what does it mean to be successful on the college level that then they further that conversation with the, with the counselor that they meet. Um, another pro is that self-reporting um, allows for placement processes to begin before transcripts are received. And I will say historically, collecting transcripts has been a challenge at Westchester, and we were worried that the pandemic was actually going to even make this more difficult. We didn't know when we would, they would arrive, if they would arrive at all. So allowing students to self-report, and this is not to say that there were not concerns, and I know that we talked a little about the concerns earlier with Elizabeth, um, are, we have the same concerns. Are students accurately reflecting their scores and their ability? And those concerns are still there and it's something we're gonna closely, closely evaluate when we look at the outcomes of how students did in their courses and how they answered the questionnaires. Um, and the last pro we considered um, was that this was actually used by a number of institutions across the country with promising results, right? We did not invent this, right? This was something I spoke to a number of institutions across in California and actually some institutions in SUNY as well that have done this before us. So speaking with these institutions has allowed our faculty to feel comfortable and provide the confidence we, could, we needed to move forward with actually going, uh, going ahead with this. Next, please. Um, so just as there's pros, you, you know, you can't make a decision just looking at all the great sunshine, you have to weigh those cons, right? What problems may this cause when you're deciding a student's placement, which is a serious matter. We don't want to misplace students if we could avoid it. So the biggest con, in my opinion, is that the process had not been piloted and there's no way to measure how it will impact student placements or success. And in a perfect world, we would have actually been able to pilot this instrument to prove the validity and the questions we chose best predicts to student success. And that's something I'm very interested in too. When we drill down to the data, can we see which questions actually prove to be the most valid towards saying, hey, this was important for them doing well in college algebra. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have that luxury with the pandemic. We had to go into full scale at a very quick rate and make this happen. And there is a risk with that, and we understand that. So at the college, we are doing everything we can to provide that additional support in students' classes to help them. Um, and again, as I said, we're going to monitor this and really see how did students do. And, I, and the proof will be in the outcomes. Um, another con was that this does rely on self-reported data, which was just a pro, but it's also a negative um, for many of us. So we were concerned, are students answering this accurately? Um, and I will say that, and I can't speak on our data just yet, but when I did speak with institutions in California, um, anecdotally, they did say students actually tended to underreport their ability. Um, and I'm not gonna sell you on that. I don't know that's the case. But it is something I can tell you we are going to look at very closely at in Westchester. We do have their transcripts. And I know it's something I've already asked Jonathan, thank you, Jonathan, um, to take a look at. We're going to see how did students report their data in these questionnaires and then compare them to our transcript data we have on file. How accurate was it um, and what it kind of impact did it have? And another con is the high level of complexity that is needed to create a valid and automated survey. So this is really kind of dependent on the type of instrument you're trying to create. I've seen some very wonderful questionnaires that are simple yet effective. For us, our vision was definitely a bit more complex. We wanted to incorporate branching logic and automate the questionnaire to, gener to generate a placement score immediately. 
And we were lucky enough to have found a software that allowed us to do that, which was Qualtrics. And even more lucky, we had Dr. Marest and we had Jonathan who have great expertise in survey design and the technical ability to develop the tool. And if you don't have that person at your institution, this can be a challenge and a barrier. Um, the last con that I will mention is the possible equity bias that must be carefully considered in design, which Elizabeth also mentioned. Anytime you ask students to self-evaluate themselves, there is a possibility that stereotype bias may influence different equity groups and how they perceive their own ability. And we are very aware of this. And again, this is something we don't have data on just yet, but we're gonna take a look at and how can we mitigate if there is issues we see among different equity groups, how can we mitigate that? And uh, to, to make sure they're, you know, they're not self-biasing themselves in the courses they don't need to be into. And those are some of the pros and cons. And um, I will pass this over to back to Dr. Ress. So thank you very much. Actually, Scott, before you go on, um, if I can ask a question that was put in the chat or re-ask it. But um, before I do that, I'm going to give two caveats. Because the question, and, and just to cue you up, is basically what is the high school GPA cutoff? So let me give my two caveats, which is um, when I first met Elizabeth at a conference, this was several years ago, I went up to her afterwards and asked her the same question. So what is the magic number? And as good researcher, she said, well, it doesn't work that way. I can't tell you here's the magical number. The second caveat is if you look at the work that was done in California with the passage of Assembly Bill 705, which we mentioned um, the other day, which essentially uh, requires direct placement into college classes and, and co-rec and, and other models, um, the way that they did is they did a deep data dive to be able to say, what is the correlation between a certain high school GPA and then passing of the college class? And then it becomes a subjective uh, cutoff point of, well, what number correlation are you looking at? Is it a 50% of the students of a certain GPA passing a course, 75%, 90%? So having said that, I'm aware that it is a question um, that it's not just, here's the magical number, and just because you did it at Westchester Community College, therefore the entire state of Nevada should do it. But having said that, I know it's a question that comes up a lot. So could you share what your high school GPA cutoff is? And thank you for Christina for putting that question in the chat. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the caveat you made was extremely important and well taken. I think that is important. You really have to look at your own historical records and, and kind of make a decision as a school. Um, I can say, so this is a bit interesting. On the record, we only have a high school GPA waiver or college level placement for English. And that GPA is an 85% or approximately a 3.1. And again, this was done really by a lot of research. We looked at what their institutions were doing, what the recommendations were, what, what the best practices were, kind of like you were mentioning. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the data that Elizabeth had done and provided for us. Um, and we shared that with the faculty and, and Elizabeth's team, when they helped us for multiple measures create our algorithm, they already did a lot of this research with them in terms of the probability of how are students gonna be successful. So we kind of had that information already. So we had a little head start. Um, the math had actually decided not to have an official waiver based on GPA, but I will say in the directed self-placement questionnaire, um, one of the, academic history questions in the academic block, which will place students in the college level, is a question about a high school GPA and also a course average GPA, which is a 80% or a 3.0. Um, so that was used for um, the DSP, but it's officially not on the books. So a little confusing, but I, I hope that answers that question. So and Scott, it, it just so you know, like I did. Uh, I just sure. I did share Scott's email. It's in the because you offered it. Uh, I did put it in the chat for everyone. <laughs> it sounds like there's opportunity for great discussion here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up pretty quickly. But um, you know, in order to do this, it does. I you know I believe after going through this that colleges do have the in-house expertise to to put this together. I since I have a background in research, I was a little skeptical about. Uh, some of the risk involved in, in using a tool that, um, you know, does this kind of thing, but um, and as essentially, you know, whether we have the expertise to truly validate it or not, it was something I was questioning. Um, but, you know, I think that we were able to do it because we brought together multiple sources of experience and information with placement and um, develop the tool that way by having a lot of people at the table 
um, but based on experience and, and evidence, uh, not it, it wasn't you know a discussion. It was you know because of the sense of urgency. It was how do we apply what we already know to this situation? Um, but Qualtrics because it uh, it combines um, the logical branching and the ability to score questions, and then you can average that score. You can have multiple. Uh, multiple scores generated in different parts of the survey. It's incredible flexibility is really what makes this kind of thing possible, um, where you can take a student through a process that you might even do just verbally in a, in a counseling session, but you can ask them these questions and move them through the questionnaire in a really logical manner and then assess their knowledge, which is what we did with the score, but not an assessment. You sort of scored to kind of a little bit like the kinds of tests you do on the internet for fun, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, what kind of person are you? But this was, you know, with these very carefully thought out directed questions. Um, so it's very clever the way that you can put this together. Um, you know, what, what I'm hearing from my colleagues around the college is that they really love it. They love the speed at which students can move through this part of the process. It leaves a lot more time because it's so um, quick to get allow students to go in and, and complete the questionnaire. It leaves much more time for them to meet with counselors, um, to determine their courses, if that's what they uh, you know, need to do. And um, so I, I'm getting a lot of very positive feedback on that. Maybe some of leaving things to the last minute did have to do with taking the Accuplacer. And so this, um, this questionnaire is, is getting them through that process more quickly. Um, I think that, you know, there's also um, an opportunity here to have dialogue with students, which may be more culturally responsive than the testing procedures. And so I do think there's an opportunity to intervene in, in the equity of standardized, the equity problems associated with standardized testing um, through this kind of process. And, you know, we're also finding that students are making, you know, some decisions that are resulting in them um, taking more college level courses. And also um, it's so we flattened our remediation and this is really underscoring the need to do that as well um, as it's really reduced our overall student um, students are not placing themselves into reading remediation, which is, I think, probably a good development for us. Um, and so, you know, basically we've seen, I think some really positive results. The, the anecdotal results from faculty are also very positive. So now we're looking for the hard data at the end of the semester and we'll continue to improve the instrument and, and work on the placement process. Because once again, just as with the algorithm, I think we've seen, um, you know, such positive results that we, we feel we need to move forward with it. Um, so we will be using it again for spring um, and continuing to develop it. So thank you. Thank you so much. We only have about five minutes left, so we might have time for maybe one question. Um, before we do that, I do want to remind everyone after today, we will send an evaluation. Those evaluations are important to us, so please be sure to fill that out. Also, we know that there's a lot of people who are watching these webinars recorded, particularly with the Thanksgiving break. Um, someone from NSHE will be sending out those links, so please encourage your colleagues to attend. We'll be taking a break for the Thanksgiving and winter recess. We will start back up in February. Um, at that point, we'll have two professional development sessions each month, two in February, two in March, two in April. So please be on the lookout for those. But I do wanna open up if we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions if they're quick questions and quick answers. Could I maybe make one comment? Um, I had um, planned to share the results of the CAPR assessment study, but um, I think it's fine if, um, but I would encourage people to look on our website, Community College Research Center, and look for both the um, SUNY research and the research out of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And what you'll find, I think, is um, that what we know, we've, we've done random assignment testing of both this algorithm and of decision rules. And what we find is that more students are placed into college level and more students are passing their college level courses. So I just wanna have, I want you to have that takeaway before we finish this session. And thanks so much for, um, for inviting us.
If we're not getting a question, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chats. Um, hopefully this has inspired the folks of Nevada and not daunted you too much because I think one of the takeaways is there's some really great ways of doing multiple measures to better serve students. And it will probably require some work in terms of thinking what's going to be best for your particular institution. Last call for question. If not, we want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving break. Please take care of yourselves. It's important during this time, get some rest, some relaxation with yourself, with your families or whoever you can safely be with. And again, we will continue again in February. Thank you to Elizabeth and all of the partners across the SUNY schools. This has really been wonderful and just rich with information. So thank you all. Thank you.